Hello there and welcome to this study on the basics of the Christian faith. Today we're going to be talking about the doctrine of the Trinity, one God in three persons. What do we mean when we say that we worship one God who is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? It's a big question. It's a big topic. We're just going to spend a few minutes. We'll only scratch the surface, but I hope it will be helpful. I'm going to begin by saying a prayer, and the prayer is going to be one of our hymns. This is hymn number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. It's one of the uh, best-known hymns in all of the Christian church, and so this is the first stanza of that hymn. Let's pray. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. Amen. So when we talk about the Trinity, the first place I think it would be helpful to look would be in Christian worship. What do we do as Christians on Sunday mornings together when we gather for worship? Uh, here at Abingdon United Methodist Church, what I'm about to say holds true, but I think it's it's broadly true in a lot of churches um, across time, really. So one of the things that you'll find in an awful lot of churches is that at some point in the worship service, the community of faith will share in what's called a creed. Creed comes from a Latin word, credo. It means I believe. But if you think about uh, the root of that word creed or credo, it also is where we get the word credit or credibility. And those are words that basically mean trust. If someone has credibility, then they have trust. If someone has credit to be able to, to borrow money, they have trust. And so when we say credo, creed, I believe, we're saying this is what I trust in. And this is, this is what we say most weeks here at Abingdon United Methodist Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Did you notice how the Trinity shows up in the creed? The, the, the creed has a threefold form. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. So right there you have the Trinity and in our statement of faith, the essential, the, the core statement of what we believe as Christians, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, another place that it shows up very often is in, in our church what we call the, the Gloria Patri. That's Latin for glory to the Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So there's another affirmation of the Trinity. Very often I will close my uh, sermons with uh, simply stepping back from what I have presented to the congregation and say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And before we depart, there is a benediction, a sending forth, a blessing, and that almost always ends with the words, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it, it's um, it's fair to say that the Trinity is all over our worship. And if you were sort of a, a, an outsider or an alien who came in and just said, what are these people doing? What's going on? You would have to conclude that this statement, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this idea of Trinity, is essential to who we are. And it is. Uh, I thought we'd look at a couple of places in the Bible uh, to, to look at where our understanding of God as Trinity comes from. So the, the first place that we're going to look is in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. It's Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. This is the closing of Matthew's gospel, the first book in the New Testament. And Jesus has been raised from the dead. He meets his disciples on a mountain in Galilee. And, and before Matthew closes the gospel, he has Jesus say this. And Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That passage, Matthew 28, is the only place in the New Testament where what we would call the Trinitarian name occurs. Now, I'm not saying it's the only place that, that Trinity is in the Bible, but it is the only place where the Trinitarian name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, occurs that way. The only time it's ever said in the name of the Father, Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And it is also true that the word Trinity, the term Trinity, is not found in the New Testament. But, uh, but, but we believe that, that the concept and the reality is all over the pages of the New Testament. So Jesus commands the disciples to go out and to baptize, but not to baptize like John the Baptist did, but to baptize in a new way, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's how we baptize today. When I baptize someone, um, if I baptize by what we call sprinkling, then I put water on the person's head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So another place um, in the New Testament where we might look for uh, a word about God as Trinity is in Mark's account of Jesus' baptism. This is Mark chapter 1, 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Did you see that? Now, you didn't have the name Trinity, the word Trinity. You didn't have the Trinitarian name in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the Trinity is all over that passage. You have Jesus the Son coming and being baptized. You have the Holy Spirit coming down, and you have God the Father speaking from heaven. One more place to look. This is in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is chapter 4. So the Apostle Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you recall to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And what I find so wonderful about that passage is here you are, um, you're outside the Gospels, um, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, has a, a Trinitarian vision of who God is. There is one body, that's the church. And then he says there's one spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. One Lord, that's Jesus Christ, and one God and Father of all. What I find striking about that passage is the recurrence of the word one. He doesn't say uh, we have one spirit and two we have the Son and three we have the Father or, or, or in another reverse order. He says one. He, he ties it all up into one, but his vision is triune. So once again, the word Trinity is not there. The traditional uh, order that we say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit is not there, but Trinity is all over Paul's understanding of who God is. This was a complicated matter for the early church. I would remind you that the earliest Christians were Jewish Christians. And for Jews, there is only one God. For some Greeks and Romans and other people in the ancient world, there were many gods. But for, for Jews, there was one God, and, and they took this very, very seriously. And so they wrestled with this uh, question. And, and there were uh, lots of people who, who couldn't go there, and they accused the Christians of, uh, first of all, of what you would call bi-theism. They say, well, you're, you say you worship God, but you also worship this Jesus. Um, and so in, in the struggle, what, what was hammered out is uh, this understanding of God as Trinity, because over and over again in Scripture, yes, uh, it affirms that God is one, but Jesus is lifted up as the, the very presence of God, indeed God himself, and, and Jesus himself in the garden before his crucifixion prays to God the Father. So you have God the Son praying to God the Father. And so the early church struggled with this, um, but eventually 
gave in and, and, and gave way and, and realized that what was breaking through here was a vision of the essence of God as, yes, one, but also triune, also trinity. Um, not talking about three gods, still still one God. There's a couple of uh, important vocabulary words. There's not going to be a test again, um, but th these are good words um, about uh the Trinity and, and help us speak better, more faithfully about God as Trinity. And so these are two, two words about uh, ways of speaking about the Trinity that we want to avoid. This is going to sound highfalutin, but, it, but it's really not. It's very important. Uh, so one is called modalism. And by the way, both of these, you, if, you, if you run out of stuff to talk about at a party, just bring these up. Uh, people will be riveted. They'll come right to you and say, oh, tell me more. Uh, but modalism is the teaching that the early church rejected that essentially says that um, God is one God who presents himself in three different ways, almost like sometimes God wears a mask or he's God the Father. Other times God puts on the mask and he's God the Son, and other times he puts on a mask that says he's God the Holy Spirit. But, but behind it all, God remains one instead of triune. Um, if that sounds a little confusing, essentially what it is saying is that God only appears to be triune, but God is not necessarily eternally triune by nature. The problem with this is that, that what it means is, one, that there's been a change within God, or that God... Um, what, the God that we meet in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit is maybe not the way that God is from all eternity, if this is just a mask that God wears every now and then. And so the, the early church said, no, no, if, if this is important enough to say about God now, then it's important enough, enough to say about God through all eternity. God is forever Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and so to return to that thing that we say in church, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. That's a way of affirming God's triune, eternal triune nature. The other uh, big highfalutin word that's not that big or highfalutin is subordinationism subordinationism. And so something is subordinate or has been subordinated, it, it means that it's been pressed down and, uh, uh, or, or maybe put a, put a thumb on something or put down and, uh, or is underneath. So subordinationism teaches that um, God the Father is really the source of the Trinity and the Son is, is less divine and the Spirit is less divine and maybe even not divine at all, that the, the real one in the Trinity that's God is the Father and then the Son and the Spirit are just sort of expressions of God the Father. Well, you, you can see what's, what's wrong with that and that takes us back to our discussion last week about the nature of Jesus. What it's really saying is, uh, Jesus is special, but just a man, and the Holy Spirit is, uh, well, we really don't know what the Holy Spirit is in that. Um, and so once again, uh, the Orthodox Christian teaching is that um, all three persons of the Trinity share in the divine nature equally. Uh, the Son is not less God than the Father. The Spirit is not less God than the Father. One God in three persons. So that's a lot. That's a big topic. Again, we've just scratched the surface. If you uh, have enjoyed this study, I hope you'll share it on social media. If you have questions, ask them in the comment section or, hey, email me at Paul C. That's my first and last name. Paul and the last name is spelled S-E-A-Y at abingdonumc.org. I'd love to hear from you. Love to welcome you to church here. We've got a, a wonderful community here of worship and service and fellowship. And, and we think that you would find a good home here as well. I pray that God will bless you this week. Take care.